Welcome back to Beyond the Headline, everyone, where we discuss the realities of launching, scaling, and investing in business. I'm really excited you're here today because I'm joined by Jeff Fernandez, the co-founder and CEO of Provo. Thank you for being here, Jeff. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me. Thrilled uh, at the opportunity to share a little bit more about our story. Can we start out with that exactly? How does Grovo work? Um, how does Grovo work? So uh, what we're doing at Grovo is reinventing learning for the modern workforce. And a very popular topic that we've heard a lot about is uh, the war on talent. And one of the biggest challenges that companies are facing today is not just attracting talent, but also motivating, engaging, and retaining that talent. And we think learning can be a competitive advantage for a lot of companies to that end. And I think it lends to a great statistic that you've shared previously, which I was shocked about, that one in 10 employees don't feel like they have the tech savvy to do their job to 100%. That's right. That's right. And what's really fascinating as well is that as millennials are, you know, making up a larger and larger portion of the workforce, what we're seeing is that they care more about the training and learning that they experience on the job than they do even about their base salaries. So training and learning, I mean, it's digital skills and management, leadership, communication, soft skills, and so many different areas of their development that they're really inspired to improve. And I think something that's so interesting with your platform in particular is once someone watches and engages with the content that's specifically relevant to their position, you're seeing people learn about other positions and other things to be more knowledgeable. Why do you think that's happening? Is it because of the micro learning? Is it that feeling inspired? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. Uh, there are four primary ways in which our customers use our product. And, you know, our customers range from, you know, a, the, the Capital Ones of the world to DDB and uh, Saatchi and Saatchi and very many others. But they, they use us in four primary ways. One is for new employee onboarding. Two is for training, like core development. Uh, three is for support use cases. So, in other words, if you have a question, you can use the platform to, to answer a question that you might have. And then four is compliance. So I think you hit the nail on the head is that our customers use us for one of these use cases or potentially for all four. But the most important thing that we drive is, again, we're a learning uh, solutions company, is learning engagement. And we found that our content library of 5,000 video lessons, it's the micro learning format that really differentiates our training from everyone else. And they're short bursts of information. They're about 60 to 120 seconds in length so that you actually will watch the video. And what we found is that that's critical for driving the completion and retention of that information. So yes, it's absolutely critical um, that the format is done in that way. Before we dive into the huge milestones that you guys have hit just in 2015 alone. I want to go back to the early days. I saw a great tweet that before you guys were 175 people, Grovo was in a closet with a mattress on the floor. Is that true? Uh, that, 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 that is true. Uh, we were absolutely in a closet and uh, there was a mattress or two on the floor and a couple of iterations of that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a fun ride. Tell us about the ride. What were the early days like? Uh, what were the early days like? So in the summer of 2010, my co-founders and I got a text message from one of our friends asking how to connect his Google Analytics into his WordPress. And with that, we became really inspired to solve the digital skills gap, which is now really just one part of the problem that we solve. But at that time, Nick Srog and I invested all the money that we had in the world, which was $60,000, and that sure seemed like a whole heck of a lot of money at the time. Um, we made it last for about nine months as we ran the company from our apartments. And you know, for us, the early days were we are the kind of company that I think identified a problem that existed in the world. 
And we didn't necessarily have a really neatly defined target customer, but we knew that this was a problem that the world was experiencing. And we, as we were building the company, we wanted to rally support around that. So as we were building out the team, we couldn't really offer very much. But what we tried to do was define what we thought a core set of values would be for the company. And, you know, acknowledging that it would evolve as time went on. But be really particular about what we cared about, the way that we ran the company, the way that, that um, our team members at the company um, interacted with each other, and what they cared about. So the early days were... I mean, yeah, there were mattresses on the floor. We housed members of the team in the early days. And, uh, you know, we, we basically did everything in our power to create a product that the world would want with very, very minimal resources. And, uh, you know, when I look back on it, I feel really fortunate to have a really inspired group of people, um, almost all of which are still with us today. Um, so, yeah, there, there were mattresses and late nights and all-nighters and... Uh, you know, everything in between. I'll never forget the day that we instituted Bagel Friday, which uh, was a huge point of celebration for the team that we could actually buy bagels every Friday for the team. So, uh, scrappy for sure. I'm glad you mentioned that, and especially the Bagel Friday being such a big accomplishment in comparison to where you guys, where you guys are right now. And it lends to a great insight that I just learned from Natasha Case, the founder of Cool House, that Founders really need to have a transcendental intoxication about their idea and bringing it to life. Because if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have worked all night on a mattress in a closet. That's right. Well, it wasn't quite a closet. It was like a 250 square foot office. <laughs> but it, it sure felt like, a, felt like a closet. And we were just inspired. We, we felt like this was something that the world absolutely needed. And... Uh, you know, we just wouldn't stop until we, we thought that, you know, we had, we had achieved that. And then to this day, I don't, I don't think we've quite achieved it. We've made a, a ton of progress, but uh, we feel like we've got a long way to go. Back when you were in the early days navigating exactly the direction you would go, when was your mental shift as CEO that, hey, we hit our stride, we're ready now? Uh, so I, I think... The, the mental shift, I, I, had, I had a handful of mental shifts along the way, um, one of which was in January 2011. Uh, just, just understanding, I, I think, at, at, at its core, what my job as CEO was. And that was ownership of the outcome, truly, you know, true ownership of the outcome of the company. And the, the requirement to make very, very many decisions quickly so that we would have a company. Um, so that I'd say that was a really important turning point for us. I think May or June 2012, um, you know, as, as we, we, we had raised some capital from, from uh, you know, the folks over at Excel and Samir and Greg Waldorf and uh, Greg Sands and, you know, just realizing that that was absolutely critical. You know, and uh, we cut a little bit close on the timing. And uh, I'll never forget, I got a, a phone call from uh, Andy Dunn, the founder and CEO of Bonobos. You know, and he said, hey, cut that one close, didn't you? Um, and he said, don't ever do that again. He said, I got a, call, I got a phone call like this one time. Um, he said, it's okay, we all go through it. But uh, you learned a very valuable, valuable lesson. And then in August 2013, when we started our sales team in New York, um, you know, I realized that part of the job as a B2B SaaS company, um, I, I think if you're able as co-founder CEO to launch your sales team and really get your hands dirty, understand your customers, and drive, uh, drive the top line of the company, then that's absolutely critical that, uh, that, that you do that because f almost no one will, will be able to do it better than you at that stage. Um, and then I'd say this year, as we're building out our executive team, realizing the transition from, you know, being able at 50 or 60 people, how different it is at 150 to 200, and how important it is to get really best-in-class executives that, that can help you scale the company. So I'd say each one of those were, you know, I'd say 
critical, I don't want to say turning points, but, but points of uh, reflection that helped me grow the company with our co-founders uh, and with our team. I'm really glad that you ended on hiring executives because there's a lot of insight out there about hiring engineers and hiring people for different positions, but not many people talk about hiring executives because they don't really get a trial run. Can't have like a 90 day trial for a CTO. What's your experience been like with that? Yeah, so it, that, that's a great question. I think that it's, I think it's really hard, right? Generally, I think it's really hard. We had uh, one of our investors share with us, you know, that it's fascinating exactly what you said is that you hear about great companies as they get built. You know, and it's about creating a great product, right, that that the market wants and getting out there and taking it to the world, and then all of a sudden you're a great company, right? But there's this critical step and it starts and doesn't really stop that is recruiting, motivating, retaining your executive team. And it's something that's just not really talked about. Uh, I think I think it's always a challenge. You know, one of the things for us that I think this year we got some really good coaching from mentors, advisors, and folks around the company just not to settle, right? Not to settle. That, you know, the idea, the notion that says that really being deliberate about, you know, what are you looking for? What aren't you looking for? Um, and, you know, functionally for, for that particular role, but then also the composition of your executive team. Right, eighty percent of what you're for what you're hiring is for the functional role, but the other twenty percent is to address the composition of your executive team. Where is it strong? Where is it weak? What do you need from this person to contribute into the executive team, and not to settle and meet very many people, and don't be rigid in your thinking as as you meet more people. Now, go in with a deliberate, clear point of view on what you know what you need and what you don't. Um, you know, identify what a unicorn would look like, but you probably get two out of three, potentially three out of three, and fight for the three out of three, um, and just do so very deliberately and don't settle. I love that you said don't settle because I think sometimes, especially with hyper growth, when your team, like you said, it's now a very different company, 150 people to 200 people, puts a lot of pressure on you as a founder, like, let me bring on people quickly to help me do this. How have you personally had that deliberate mindset? So how, how I've had the deliberate mindset is, um, I'm one, I like documentation generally, and I like process. So, you know, a handful of things that, that we've done here at Grovo that I think are helpful to that end. We do uh, a very deliberate quarterly planning process where we identify, we do a slingshot where we identify what's what's working, what's not working, new opportunities, and what we learned from the previous quarter. We have three goals, ten priorities, a not now list, all of which is in rank order. And we do that not only for the company itself, but for every team at the company. So that I think is is helpful in the guidance. And then for you know for all positions, we create very detailed job descriptions. And for executive level roles, um, we even put together scorecards and ideal candidate mat uh, matrices that are really helpful in guiding our thinking. And those those items, I'd say, they might change a bit. I, don't, I wouldn't say that they change um, materially, but we do absolutely update our thinking as we calibrate and compare what we're seeing in the world to what our expectations were. And that gives us, I think, a really solid foundation to... Um, um, to be thoughtful about it, you know, so that that's how we do it. When it comes to your hiring process for anyone who's going to be a senior leader on your team, what's that like? So our hiring process for senior leaders on the team, I mean, oftentimes it starts with, you know, I'd say a, a, a brief phone conversation. And uh, what I like to do is um, do the first set of interviews myself, almost always. Um, that's an hour, maybe two hours, right, just to get in front of someone and uh, you know, ask a whole bunch of questions, some of which are functional, some of which are just more humanistic in nature. Um, then the next step in the process is uh, you know, to meet more of the folks on the management team, right? And then the next step in the process is to meet 
uh, additional folks who are you know in, involved functionally in that particular leader's unit. Um, then next is usually a dinner in parallel with a conversation with a board member, perhaps two, and then uh, after that, a final dinner and an offer. Wow, so it's a super long process then. It's it's yeah. We 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 like to take a relatively, like I said, a deliberate approach, and. Uh, to make sure that we have our points of calibration. And one of the things that I found that that's really important is, as one of the things I like about that that process is, it gives us an opportunity to observe and be observed in multiple settings. Right, so you really get more data points about the candidate, and the candidate get, gets more data points um, not only about me but also about our team and senior roles, mid level roles potentially even a junior role or two. And you know, then they have the opportunity to see you know, not only how we interact in one format, but also as a group and in different dynamics. And we can also see how that person interacts in all of those dynamics. So I think it's really helpful. I love it. And that was inspired, you know, talking about hiring senior executives from a blog post that you shared from Ben Horowitz. And yeah. one of the great insights that he included in there was how do you as a CEO Hire for a senior position that you know nothing about, you know, head of sales or CTO, whatever your specialty is in. What's that like? Because that seems super challenging. Oh, I think it, it can absolutely be challenging. I, I think first, first and foremost, I think it starts with recognition that this is not necessarily in your domain or functional area of expertise should you have one. Um, at the same time, after that the realization... Um, I think it's really important to recruit and enlist the support and mentorship of folks around the company that you trust who can help uh, help you gain a point of view on you know what is the status quo, what exists today, what is missing today, what are we likely to see in candidates, and given all of that, what do we think? think on the axes on which we should be thinking about candidates. Um, what are those axes? And when forced to choose, given the, you know, the set of circumstances, that we should prioritize A and B potentially over C, right? And then put together the documentation, the ideal candidate matrix, right? Um, the scorecard and the job description. Once you have, I'd say, that level of nuance and get some feedback on it and then go to market with it. And, uh, you know, oftentimes you wind up working with an executive search firm as well and they're quite helpful through the process. And one of, you know, at the same time though, I think you really as, as CEO, you know, my experience of it is, you know, allocating 30 to 40% of your time to searching and, and, and spending time with people is really close to a requirement. Right? That's a big part of, I think, what the job entails. As you grow the company now really on a new frontier, who are some of the culture champions that you look up to? Who are some of the, the culture champions that I look up to? Um, so so there, there's a variety of folks, you know, some of whom are you know, from all different industries, backgrounds, jobs, etc. I mean, I look up to the folks at Netflix. I mean, how could you not? What they've done is is fascinating, and uh, you know, they set the standard in a lot of ways. I really, I really like their uh, tour of duty concept. Uh, I think that's quite fascinating. I mean, Zappos, of course, and what they're doing with the holacracy, while controversial, I just find fascinating. Right. So, you know, I, I, I consume a lot of information about about what what Zappos has done in, in the early days. But also, I, I think, you know, as the company's matured and evolved, um, I also look to, you know, a handful of other folks. Um, there's a legendary football coach. His name is Bill Walsh. He coached the San Francisco 49ers uh, during the Joe Montana era. And the 49ers were, were not necessarily a great football team at that time. And, you know, understanding what, what he did and how he culturally had an enormous impact on the way that the entire organization functioned. Um, you know, I look up to that too because that to me is culture and it comes in so many different formats. 
Um, so I, I'd say th those are probably the primary sources of, uh, of inspiration. And, and also, you know, our, our chairman, Greg Waldorf, right? Greg uh, was the founding investor and former CEO at eHarmony. And, uh, you know, he's now CEO of a company called invoice to go And, you know, I have a lot of conversations with him about you know, how, how, how to think through uh, building a great culture, right? And one of the most important things that he shared with me that I think it really resonated is you're not looking to maintain your culture. You can never maintain your culture. It's an impossibility. Instead, what you're looking to do is intentionally evolve your culture and have that be 12, 18, or 24 months out, ideally 18 to 24 months out. Where do you want the culture to be? What works well now? What are some areas that you potentially want to refine or areas you want to totally remove, right? But the idea is that you evolve it as you go. And the more, I think, deliberate that you can be about that, and then also transparent then with the entire organization, the, the better results you'll see. And also the more camaraderie that the organization will feel in, in relating to those changes as they're happening. I'm so glad you said that because I've become accustomed to saying, how do you maintain your culture? And that is put so intelligently and deliberately, like you've said, to grow the future of your company. Yeah, like I said, it was one of those one of those things when Greg said that to me. It just it, uh -huh. it real yeah. I was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me because if I if, if we're trying to maintain our culture, I feel like we're losing, right? If we're trying to evolve it, it, it feels progressive and exciting. I'm glad that you also mentioned Bill Walsh because you used to play football. What did your time on the field and in athletics teach you about leadership? So I think my, my time on the field and, and um, athletics, it taught me a lot about leadership. And leadership comes in a variety of different formats. And some folks are tremendous leaders by example, and other folks are, are much more vocal. Earlier in my life, um, I think I, I, I led less vocally, and I, I led by example. And as I, I've grown up a bit, I've become more vocal in, uh, in the way that, that I lead. And particularly my time playing football, uh, my high school football coach, Jim Wickman, uh, he, he said very many things to us, but one always stood out to me was that football in particular is 11 people on a field. And for that individual play to go well, all 11 of those people must do their jobs as expected, in parallel and lockstep. And these are potentially very different kinds of human beings, right? Some of which are, you know, they, they have very different jobs. Some are very fast, some are very big and strong, right? Some can throw, some can write very different positions on the field. And that just struck me because um, that feels like life to me. And that feels like a company to me. You have very many different roles. So when I think about Grovo, we have, you know, in our content team, writers, video editors, um, animators, instructional designers. We have you know, a business operations team of quantitative folks, salespeople. We have engineers and all different kinds of engineers, right? And all of these people at any one given moment for the company, you know, ideally to succeed and continue on what I'd like to think is a relatively aggressive growth trajectory um, need to not only execute in parallel, but also need to deeply respect what every other person or team is doing uh, to, to achieve ideally a shared goal. So th that, that's the primary thing that I took from athletics that I think had a pretty fundamental impact on my perspective of, of leadership but also in organizing teams and how to think about team dynamic and chemistry. Very well said, my friend. Thanks. So when you think of, like you were just saying, now you're on an aggressive trajectory to grow, what is the Jeff Fernandez vision of Grovo in the next couple of years when you think of the big picture? Uh, so the Jeff Fernandez vision of what Grovo will be in the next few years is 
I think we're solving a very important problem right now, yeah. which is learning engagement. Right? We're a learning solutions company and we do we, we have technology that solves it, we have a service that solves it, and we also have our, our content that solves it. And learning engagement is so critical for the C suite of very many companies. But what in a couple of years I think that eventually moves to is learning engagement as a means to drive employee engagement. Right? And you need to you need to get the learning engagement in a place where um, employees feel motivated, inspired that they're learning and that they're improving. But that translates then into employee engagement. Where what I mean by that is employees then feel a deeper connection to the organization, a deeper loyalty to the place, and also then um, deeper resonance to the company's core values and to the company's core operating procedure and, and, and the way that the, the ways in which that company is different. And employee engagement is the key to unlock extraordinary uh, uh, performance. You need employees to be extraordinarily engaged to be able to achieve great results. And if you look at very many of the best companies, the companies that achieve phenomenal results, um, their employee employees are typically quite motivated, quite inspired, and they're very engaged. So I'd say as we're building our, our, our product and, and as we're thinking about the future, that's the direction that we're heading. I love it. So before Thanks. we go, we always end with a couple of life questions. You ready? Uh -oh. Yeah, I'm scared. Uh, they're simple. They're simple. No like big, like what's the meaning of life? Not yet. All right. <laughs> when I say best party, you think of... When, I, when you say best best party feel like your first like maybe, maybe not your first birthday party you probably don't remember but i i think of great sound and good music got it when, i like i like audio when i say best gift you think best gift health I like i wasn't expecting that it's a good one last Thanks. one when i think of favorite when i say favorite story what do you think of favorite story um one that makes us laugh or one that makes us cry but something that like touches you i love it well you're certainly it's a great way to end you're certainly touching so many individuals lives with what you're doing at grovo how can well, everyone you. stay up to date with you and then also for companies who are tuning in how can they learn more and request a demo and everything? Yeah, I appreciate it. So just visit visit grovo.com, G-R-O-V-O.com. Um, take a look around. You can learn more about our mission, about you know the products and services that we deliver. You can request a demo. Um, you can reach out to me directly as well. Just Jeff, J-E-F-F -F, at grovo.com. Happy to have a chat. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate the time.